Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining Spotlight on Bicycling. I'm Connie Zabo-Schmucker. I'm Advocacy Director at Bicycle Garage Indy. And tonight we're going to talk about a major tailor and specifically the exhibit that's going to be at the Indiana State Museum starting March 5th. Um, Kisha Tandy is here. She is the Curator of Social History at the Indiana State Museum. And she did um, the research and um, everything that goes into putting together this exhibit. So I'm really excited that she's joining us and, and we can find out more about, um, about Major Taylor and about um, what she's done for this exhibit and how it came about. So a um, couple of housekeeping things. If you have, um, you know, stay muted and um, till we might have some question answer or you can type question and answer into the chat. Um, I'll also have this recording up on Bicycle Garage Indy's YouTube channel, so you can watch it later as well. Um, and I'll put some links in the chat. And I'm trying to think what else. Um, so the Spotlight on Bicycling um, occurs on the third Monday of the month. And so this is our second one so far this year and plan on going through through the year, but monthly this year. Last year I did them weekly for the per first couple months, but um, that got a little bit unwieldy to, to do every week. So we're doing them every month. If you have ideas of topics or organizations you'd like me to highlight, please feel free to reach out to me or put those in the chat. And um, I think, I think that's all I have at this point. So I will turn this over to Kisha. Thank you very much, Kisha. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am here today to discuss the new exhibit that will open at the Indiana State Museum here in Indianapolis on March 5th. The exhibit is titled Major Taylor, Fastest Cyclist in the World, and it will run from March 5th through October 23rd. Marshall Major Taylor was born in Indianapolis in 1878. He was one of eight children. His father was a Union soldier veteran and his father's name was Gilbert Taylor. His mother was Sophronia Taylor. They lived in Kentucky and then came here to Indianapolis and Major was born here in 1878. In his early life here, his father worked for a gentleman by the name of Albert Southern, and he went to work with his father, and he would become, as he describes in his autobiography, the companion and playmate of the Southern son, which was named Daniel, and he would become his friend and playmate, and when he received a bicycle, he made sure Major also received a bicycle. So that was his uh, first bicycle. He would train and he would teach himself how to do tricks. So one of the interesting things about Major Taylor is that we know him as a, a sprinter and this world champion and this cyclist who could race very fast, but he started off and actually he did tricks very early. And this trick riding was something that he did and would also continue to do at various points during his career. And so it was from this early uh, friendship with Daniel Sutter that he had his beginnings in riding his bicycle and learning to ride. When one day he had a repair that needed to be done to his bike, he went and visited the Hay and Willits bicycle shop. And while he was there, he did a trick in the middle of the store and that caught the attention of the owner. And from there, it kind of, he kind of just continued to go on. He um, would race, have early races here in Indianapolis and surrounding areas, and then just kind of go from there. And what is really interesting about that is that he, he as he was working, he admired this medal. And he just admired that medal. And once when he was racing, he was able to obtain a medal that was hanging in the store where he worked. Major Taylor, this champion cyclist, 
was an individual who kept a lot of records and he would write his own story. He would publish his autobiography. And I want to explain that now because a lot of the information that I'll be talking about are things that he detailed in his autobiography, but then also detailed in the collection that is here at the Indiana State Museum. And so Major would um, go on and have championship dreams and become a major cyclist. Um, but all of that started here in Indianapolis. And he started, as far as we can tell, through the records and research. His first race was around 1890. And he would stay here in Indianapolis until 1895. He had a mentor here by the name of Lewis Bertie Munger, who also had been a former cyclist and was someone who would create bikes, who would build bikes, and he had a factory here in Indianapolis. And when Mr. Munger left Indianapolis, he would take Major with him and Major would go to Massachusetts. And when Major and Munger left Indianapolis, Mr. Munger told some of his friends, as recorded in his autobiography, that when Major returned, he would be a champion cyclist of the world. Major would come back in 1896, and he would race, and he would have different opportunities to compete on cyclists and tracks here in Indianapolis, even if he was only racing against time and not against other individuals. And by 1896, he would be a professional. His professional debut was actually a six day race of tremendous endurance where, you know, he talks about riding for 18 hours at a time. And that was at Madison Square Garden. And by 1898, so that was 1896. By 1898, he had set seven world records. By 1899, he was a world champion. He won the world one mile in Montreal, Canada. And by 1900, he was an American sprint champion. So you can see these various different things that are going along in his life and how he is winning and he um, is a champion, but he also had to deal with many other issues. In his autobiography, he talks about the dreadful monster prejudice and he um, details very specifically the different things that he had to deal with on the track from individuals blocking him in and uh, not giving him the opportunities and pocketing and just the various things as he was on the track, but then also being able, having places to stay, places to train, being uh, banned from different areas, being uh, barred from competition, and all of those things that came together with that. So Major was dealing with so much, and even as early as 1894, a very young Major wrote to the Bearings uh, Bicycle Magazine in response to uh, the law organization not wanting to have Black men as a part of the uh, organization having Black writers. So as early as 1894, he was using his voice and, and writing and trying to you know, wrong this, uh, right this wrong. And, and I appreciate Taylor for being able to do all of that. And so that's a little bit about his background. And before I go to his becoming an international superstar, I want to talk a little bit about the collection that we have here at the State Museum and that collection and how it um, came to be a part of the collection part of the museum uh, collection in history and how we use that collection to help tell the story of Major Taylor. The collection was donated here to the museum in 1988 by his daughter, Rita Sidney Taylor Brown. And she was born in 1904 and she would live a very long time. And she donated the materials to the museum. Now, this collection is a significant collection. And every time I think about this collection, I think Major knew that one day he was going to tell his story. I, I just have to think that he knew one day that this was going to be important. And in fact, in his autobiography, he talks about the reasons why he wanted to 
uh, write his story so that he can be of inspiration and share information to um, individuals, young people like him. And I, again, have to admire and applaud that. And so within this collection, you have nine scrapbooks. And these scrapbooks are full of information. They're full of clippings, newspaper clippings. They are documentation of just his career. And so you are able to gain the information from that you read about in his autobiography, but you can see it really in first hand. And the fact that he was so detailed, so the earliest scrapbook begins in around 1898 and it goes, the scrapbooks go up to 1904. And so that really chronicles uh, his, the, you know, his career and his going to the uh, overseas and traveling and being an international superstar. And so that is just a wonderful set of information and that we are able to use that to help to tell his story is wonderful. And in fact, you know, these are, these are artifacts that are, you know, over 100 years old. And so uh, we had conservation work done on one and that will be a part of the exhibit. So you will be able to see one of major scrapbooks. Again, there are nine, but you'll be able to see one of them. And also in this collection, we have several photographs and just wonderful photographs. Again, chronicling his story, highlighting different places that he went, and just showing him at the different points of his career. We have two trophies that will be on exhibit. They are both from 1901. And when you look at these trophies, they're a little bit different from trophies that uh, we consider today. They are very interesting in detail. So I invite you that when you come to the exhibit and be a part of the experience that you take note of these uh, trophies. And in addition, we have a set of several postcards. And the postcards, I had so much fun reading, or and I still have fun reading the postcards because Major would send these postcards to his wife and daughter. He would marry Daisy Victoria Morris in 1902, and he would have his daughter, Rita Sidney Taylor, in 1904. And Taylor, a remarkable athlete, a remarkable athlete, but he was a devoted husband and a devoted father. And the love that he had for his wife and daughter is on exhibit through these postcards. So prior to his daughter's birth, he was sending postcards to his wife and he would send these wonderful little notes and you know at making asking how they were doing and and also just sending happy greetings you know just really wanting to um, share that with his uh, wife and eventually his daughter and so when they could not travel with him he would send those home to them and then there are a series of letters and these letters are from 1909. And what is interesting about these letters, and unfortunately, we don't have the responses that he received back. So all of the letters are to his wife, uh, Daisy, and to his daughter, uh, Sydney. And in these letters, the letters are amazing. They, they truly are. He is greeting, uh, and occasionally he calls his wife, Granny, and occasionally he calls his daughter, Little Bear, and he always refers to them as dears. So again, you can see the affection. It just, it just comes through in these letters. And he would send these letters uh, because in, by 1909, he was uh, toward the end of his racing career and he, he was homesick and he missed his wife and daughter. And within those letters, he talks about his training regimen, his lack of sleep or his getting good amount of sleep, what he was eating. He was, uh, he often ate raw eggs. Um, he also ate chocolate, which I find really interesting. And, uh, and so he would talk about, write about all of that. He would write about the races and how he was doing on the track and the treatment from other riders. He mentions his promoter uh, in several races. And he just gives a really 
good set of details. And so those letters are just full of wonderful information to help you tell the story of Major Taylor, but also to help you learn about Major Taylor. And I think those letters provide such significant amount of information. And so we actually will have letters that we took different sections and had a local Indianapolis artist uh, that will read, has read them and we recorded them. And so they will be a part of the exhibit. You will get a, the opportunity to see uh, Major's handwriting. We will reproduce some of those letters so that you can see that, but you'll have uh, Mr. Um, Dominique Selby being able to give a, a, an artistic approach. And so you'll be able to hear. And no, we do not know what Major sounded like. We we don't know what his voice sounded like. We have, you know, in my mind, I, I think I know what Major sounded like, but we don't know what he sounded like. But this will at least give voice to the letters. In addition, you'll be able to see within the exhibit the postcards and various pieces from the collection. And so this collection really is a foundation. And I know as we began this discussion, one of the things was how did this exhibit come together? We have truly a significant collection that helps us to tell his story. And we are able to highlight and share with the many visitors that we hope to come that they'll be able to um, see these materials and learn from it and be inspired, definitely be inspired by Major Taylor's story. So I've given you a little bit of the background of the collection. So I'll talk a little bit more about his career um, post 1900. So in 1901, he would make his first trip to Europe and he would actually have his first race in uh, Germany and he would race there and then he would go and race in Paris. And throughout his career, he would race in Paris and he would race in Sydney, Australia and various places. So he was indeed an international superstar. He would race 1901, 1902, uh, 1903 and four. And then he would race again, um, seven, eight in the 1907, 1908 and 1909. And he, would have these various races. And he would, um, again, he was very, uh, had a lot of wins, um, very victorious, a lot of first place. And you can find that information within the newspaper clippings. Also, there's a small book, but then other individuals have written uh, biographies of Major Taylor. So you have that information. And be sure Major also included that in his autobiography. And so throughout that time period, he is racing in various places um, overseas. And so we look at this idea of where he was racing outside of the United States. His last recorded race that we know of would take place in 1910, and that would actually be in Utah. And so uh, that would be his... Uh, final professional race, he would race and win a 1917 race, which was an old timers race. And the interesting thing about that race is that Munger, uh, who I mentioned was his, uh, an early mentor and someone who had been there at the very beginning would also be there for that race. And I, I think that I'm sure that, that was very sentimental and that Taylor appreciated him being there. And so you have this young man born in Indianapolis in 1878 and then would be racing all across the world, you know, and would race until around 1910. And what we are able to gain not only from his collection and from his autobiography is the story of a remarkable athlete, a devoted husband and father, and someone who was aware of various things that were going on throughout his life and career, both personal and his professional career, and that we have all those, those things. I hope that visitors to the exhibit will be inspired 
by his story, that they will learn from his story, that they will pause and think about all the things that Major Taylor experienced, that he went through, that they will gather some of the history that uh, that was that he records and that he had to live through. And so we truly hope that people are inspired. There's a team of us that worked on this exhibit doing research, finding images, and that we were able to uh, just use so many resources and to have all of that there. One of the beautiful things about having the Major Taylor Collection is that there is, and there are family members that are still um, researching his story and helping to tell his story and that who come to Indianapolis and who honor his legacy and who are excited when others are researching and sharing and highlighting the life and legacy of Major Taylor. And once you visit the exhibit, which we hope that you all will come and visit, you will have the opportunity to see some of these things and to hopefully recognize and to honor Major Taylor. The exhibit will have materials for individuals who are interested in history, who are interested in cycling, and who just are just an overall appreciation for history of Indianapolis and for the life of Major Taylor. You'll also have the opportunity to build a bike, uh, to ride a bike and you will have the opportunity to see one of Major Taylor's bikes. It comes to us from the United States Bicycle Hall of Fame in Davis, California. And so earlier during the images, uh, Miss Connie showed one of the images. And so we are extremely excited to be able to have this bike here and that it will be um, part of the exhibit. Uh, just. I'm so excited. This is the a bike that we know that we can attribute back to Major Taylor. And to be able to have this as a part of the exhibit is, is just a wonderful addition, a wonderful artifact. So you will have the opportunity to do that. And you will have the opportunity to see how Major's life has inspired other cyclists and African-American cyclists. And so this is just a wonderful um, opportunity to learn those different things. So I um, see that there uh, is a question that popped up in the chat. So I'm going to pull it up again and I will um, answer that. That is an overview and a, and a good, a pretty good history, um, but I can go in and answer the questions. And thank you, Evan. Yes, I am. I love and appreciate that he documented things as well. And so the question is, after he stopped racing, how did he support himself and his family? Did he make money from selling his story? So Major actually made a very good living for racing. For a good part of his career, he would not race on Sunday. And so that was a hindrance. But throughout his career, Major actually did make a significant amount of money. And so when he came home, he did have money. Um, he did use his savings to go into various automobile uh, and wheel types of businesses. So he um, actually uh, had a business where he would wait and uh, create a will and another business. And so he did lose money on that. And he would actually work um, in another field. So he uh, received, he had a job where um, he worked um, after his career. So he uh, passed away in 1932. So his racing career, 1910 to uh, 1932, but he published his autobiography in 1928, which was not necessarily the best time to be selling an autobiography. So he would go door to door. He eventually went to Chicago to try to sell his autobiography. And uh, while he was there, he would pass away. And so unfortunately, Major actually, when he passed away and was buried, he actually was buried um, in a pauper's grave. So uh, this remarkable life and story, uh, this was something that actually uh, ended up. And so we will comment on those things and talk about that. But 
mostly we'll, you know, sharing the story of all those things before that. So he did uh, try to sell that. The amount of money that he made from that was not significant uh, at all. And um, so he was buried in 1932. But in 1948, a group of cyclists, former cyclists, um, the Cycling All-Stars um, worked and contacted um, Schwinn of the Schwinn Bikes, and they were able to have him, uh, he was reinterred, and then he uh, passed a new uh, grave site. And so that was something. And then there's a new marker with a wonderful quote about the career of Major Taylor and that he was um, gone but not forgotten. And that is definitely how we have looked at this, making sure that his legacy continues and that people are aware of all the things that he was. Again, a remarkable athlete, but a devoted husband and father, someone, and I, I always like to say he was an occasional poet. If you, you can actually find his book online through Google Books. And he, uh, he there's various times where he's writing in there and he's writing poetry and he's sharing that. And so uh, he had, he had different interests and uh, there's uh, articles from his time in Paris. And it talks about Major having a wonderful singing voice and uh, him playing the piano. Uh, one of the, one of my favorite things is that he would bring his daughter um, gifts and his, his daughter's gifts would be animals and, and various things. So uh, you have all of that. So we hope that we've given a, an overview of his life and you can, and being able to do that. Um, someone asked if I could provide the link to the book. I will do that right now. I will, I will definitely do that right now because, and the good thing about this book is that you can um, actually read it all for free. And, and if you're someone who likes to read biographies as well, there is a biography that was done by Michael Cranish that is, is just an amazing um, biography. The earliest one, and I'll mention this, was done by Andrew Ritchie. And what, and what Andrew was able to do was just really, again, kind of bring his story to the forefront, you know, and bring, and so that we uh, actually know about Major Taylor. And so the, the idea that Major, um, that he, and one of the things, and this is something that I, I plan to do more of after the exhibit is opening is that the correspondence between um, Andrew Ritchie and correspondence between Andrew Ritchie and Major Taylor's daughter, we had that. And so just looking at that some more and and the and what was in those. And so I do look forward to being able to to Get, you know, gain some more information from that as well. So I am getting the um, book for you all. Yeah, while you're doing that, I just wanted to say that I've, I've known about Major Taylor for a long time. I read um, Andrew Ritchie's biography when it came out you know, years and years ago. And I just recently read Andrew or Michael Cranish's um, biography of him. And I also did read Mar Major Taylor's bi um, autobiography. Um, and all of them were very, very good and, and very inspiring. Uh, there was actually a mini series movie about his career. Um, I forget when, um, but it was, it's not, it was a um, kind of low budget TV miniseries and it just covered his, his career in, in Australia. I think it was an Australia production, um, but it was, if you can ever find it, it, it was, it was kind of a neat, um, a neat view of his life at that point. Um, let's see. Right. And 
I have never seen that um, that film. I've seen parts of it, but not the entire. I think uh, it's like Wheels of Glory or Wheels. Yes. Yeah. So if you do a if you do a search on Wheels of Glory, it was. I don't know how I was wanting to like get a copy of it just so I had it and and I've not been able to find it because I I think since it was a TV miniseries they didn't really make a video or anything of it so it's difficult to find um yeah and then you know we're kind of having a renaissance of Major Taylor with a mural on Washington Street and now this exhibit um yeah. and I did want to mention that there is also a um major taylor meetup rides that's going to be happening this summer in june and i've got let me see if i can do you see the major taylor invitational you can see that okay um so it's going to be june uh, let me see if i can find the dates on it June 17th, 18th, and 19th in Indianapolis. It's the first time that the Major Taylor Cycling Clubs have ever gotten together. Um, so it's really, it'll be really cool and it's being done in his hometown. And I know that part of that, they're going to do a historical ride that includes um, a stop at the Major Taylor Velodrome and possibly some other places that he grew up and um, trying to think what else they're doing. They will be going to the to the exhibit as part of as part of their activities. Um, but that's that's coming up in June and that's that's pretty exciting as well. And if you haven't been downtown Indianapolis and seen the big five story mural of Major Taylor, it's it's really awesome. Um, I went down this last summer when they were creating it and just, I took pictures when it just got started. And then, you know, when it finally was done, I got the whole, you know, the whole picture of everything. And um, we have Bicycle Garage Indy put together a mural ride on Ride Spot. And it, um, it starts at the, at the city market and it goes by Major Taylor's mural as well as Kurt Vonnegut's mural and the Jazz Greats mural and um, James, uh, James Whitcomb Riley mural, Mary Evans mural and uh, Reggie Miller's mural. I think there's six murals on it. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we got, that I did it after the Major Taylor mural was done. Um, so I will, I'll put, I'll see if I can find that. Um, I'll put a link to that in in the description of the video. So if you wanna check out the video afterwards, I'll see if I can find that pretty quick um, and put it in chat as well. But um, so does anybody else have any additional questions for Kisha? I like the way that you describe having a renaissance. There is a version of the mural at the Indianapolis airport, the artist Sean Michael Warren. Um, there's a smaller version and that is also at the airport. And since many of you uh, ride and maybe ride downtown, there is as part of the talking wall outdoor uh, public art piece that is on the campus of IEPUI um, on the cultural trail. Um, Major Taylor is featured as part of the talking wall piece that was created by Bernard Williams. And uh, you can also draw a ride past there. And if some of you are interested in tours and various things, we did uh, the education staff, the exhibit staff here put together a tour of places that were a part of Major's life while he lived here in Indianapolis. So that is something that will also be available so that um, individuals can visit different places that made, where Major visited and that were a part of his life while he lived here. That, that is awesome. Yeah, so I'd, I'd actually like to see that tour as well. Um, might make a ride of it, a <laughs> ride as well. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's it's been, you know, I've always, well, not always, but I think in the early 80s learned about Major Taylor. Um, I know that there were people locally who were involved with getting the velodrome named after him. Um, and that was probably the first first real recognition, you know, belatedly, but, you know, and that was in the, in like 1982 when the velodrome was built. Yes. Um, but there's, if you ride along Fall Creek Trail near the Fall Creek Trail on the Monon, there is a historical, well, on the Monon, there's a historical marker, but there's also just last year, I think, was put up a um, description more about yes. major mm-hmm. Yes, so, definitely. So there's, yeah. Then there's also another historical marker uh, near the uh, parking lot near the state fair grounds. So you have kind of three in the pretty near each other. Yeah. Recognizing so, him. There's some effort to get the 38th Street Bridge. Um, the Monon Bridge over 38th Street named after Major Taylor since the historical markers are right there. Um, but we'll, um, we'll, we'll see how, the, I'm not sure the process of that is, or, or the status of that, but that there are some people who are interested in getting that done as well. Um, and there's a group called Major Taylor Coalition who is, they were really, instrumental in getting the mural done. Yes. Um, Last year, um, I had the, um, I had folks from the Indianapolis Art Council and talking about the Major Taylor mural and and how that came to be. And and Anthony Bridgman was on that call as well and described what, you know, they thought it would be a simple idea and it took (laughs) four years to happen. (laughs) So, um, so, I'm really thrilled to see the mural. I think it was a, you know, wonderful job that everybody did and the artist was was great. Um, and it's exciting that it's also at the art, the art museum. So, I mean, not the art museum, the um, airport. Um, so people can see it as they come into the city, which is great. Um, so I think we're, unless you have anything else, Kisha, that you would like to mention? I would just like, again, to invite you all to visit the museum when the exhibit opens on March 5th. If you are interested and would like to see more of the collection, you can visit the collection at indianamuseum.org and you can go under the collection and you can enter um, Major Taylor and various pieces from the collection will come up. And so you have the opportunity to see some of the materials there, several materials in the collection. So not all of it will actually be out on exhibit, but if you're interested in that, please feel free to visit the online collection and I did put the link for the autobiography in the um, chat. And again, thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. And I do hope that you all have the opportunity to visit the exhibit from March 5th until October of 2022. Thank you very much, Kisha, for joining us. And um, I'm looking forward to it. And who knows, I might go there multiple times. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.